Hi, Richard. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm well. Good. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV. You are Richard Vague, uh, and you're in Philadelphia, and perhaps more important, for our purposes, you're the author of the book that I'm holding up, The Next Economic Disaster, Why It's Coming, and How to Avoid It. It's also about the last economic disaster, um, I would say. Uh, it's about uh, why we didn't do a very good job of anticipating it, or in your view, responding to it, I think. Um, the book is published by University of Pennsylvania Press. Um, it says on this book that you are a former banker and the managing partner of Gabriel Investments and chairman of the Governor Woods Foundation. And I should say that um, a few years ago, uh, Governor Woods uh, gave a generous donation to the Non-Zero Foundation, which operates um, Blogging Heads TV. What it doesn't say here, uh, in the bio, in your bio, is that you, I think, could be called the inventor of, or at least a pioneer of, the famous co-branded credit card. That's, you know, when your credit card doesn't just say MasterCard, it also has the name of your university on it or United Airlines or, so, or on it or something, right? That was that was you. We have you to thank for that? Well, sir, I'm certainly one of them, so. And that was, uh, you, and that was like, what, ten, whenever it was, you, you kind of got into that. Uh, I mean, I guess there's... You, that, would have been, not, that would have been the 1980s. Okay. And that was your first big venture into banking. And you're not taking as much credit as I'm told you deserve for this, but uh, but I gather you were... you were. You I was were, deeply involved in the banking business, ran a couple of very large banks, had really had the largest uh, Visa credit card program in the world, and, and was CEO of that for a while. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you know a thing or two about credit and debt, and as we will see, that's a big part of the story you have to tell in this book. Now, um, the last economic disaster took a number of people by surprise. Certainly the government doesn't seem to have done a, a good job of uh, heading it off or anticipating it. And a big part of the argument you're making in this book is that that shouldn't be the case, that these things are actually, these economic calamities are actually a lot easier to predict than many people, including a lot of economists, recognize, right? Absolutely. You know, we, we looked rigorously and systematically at all financial crises post-World War II where you have data, which is most of them. And in every single case, it is always the same thing. It is a rapid increase in private debt to GDP or the private mm -hmm. debt to GDP ratio in a five-year period. If that grows 18% or more, uh, and your overall level of private debt is, is already high, let's say 150% to GDP, which most that's true of most developed nations now. If those mm -hmm. two things uh, happen in combination, you pretty much have a financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And since it doesn't happen over months, instead it happens over five or more years, that gives you ample time to see it in advance. Okay. Now I'm going to show people a graph from the book. There's a lot of good graphs in the book. Um, this one just charts three things. Uh, in the United States, uh, prior to the uh, economic disaster, the economic disaster is the vertical line. That's 2008. And it, the, the, top, uh, the top line is private debt. The bottom line is public debt, you know, the government's debt. The middle line is GDP. And, and people will notice that the slope of public debt and GDP are about the same leading up to the crisis, which means that... Uh, Public debt isn't growing uh, relative to, to GDP much. What is clearly growing relative to GDP is private debt. And then you um, you look at a number of crises and show us the same graph. Um, here's one from uh, Japan in the run-up to its 1991 crisis. Uh, and you see you just see the same thing um, time and again. Here's uh, the United Kingdom, 2007, 2008. It's always a very marked increase in private debt relative to GDP. Um, and that's kind of funny because after the crisis, the, the next big political showdown was about public debt, right? Uh, and, and, you know, there was this standoff between the Democrats and the Republicans about um, do, getting the public debt under control. But that just seems to not generally be a big part of the problem, the way these things unfold, right? That's exactly right. You know, most of the political debate since the crisis has been about public expenditures and public debt. Most economic theory focuses 
way more on the issue of public debt than private debt. And yet, it is private debt that causes crises. And furthermore, uh, in the United States, private debt to GDP in 1950 was only 55 percent, and today it's 156 percent. It's tripled in a little over two generations, and it is that heavy load, that heavy burden of private debt that is actually what is weighing down the economic recovery here and in Europe as well, and, and continue, you know, causing the recovery to continue to disappoint. And yet, this private debt factor is one that is uh, largely not discussed. Okay. And let's kind of put a finer point on this. Uh, private debt includes things like, well, obviously home mortgages, that which figured prominently in the last big crisis, but, but what else? Private debt, as we define it, is all business debt and all consumer debt. And business debt is about 55, you know, right now in the U.S., that's $26 trillion. Mm -hmm. uh, about 55% or more of that is business debt. The rest is consumer debt. And of that consumer debt, most of it, 70 plus percent, is home mortgages. Things like credit cards and student loans, even though they get a lot of press, are a tiny sliver of that. Student loans mm -hmm. is about trillion dollars out of that twenty-six trillion. Mm -hmm. Credit cards is about six hundred billion out of that twenty-six trillion. Mm -hmm. And one reason uh, people might not notice the problem developing is when there is a lot of private debt. Uh, you might say, "Well, yeah, the people have a lot of debt, but they're, you know, if you look at their balance sheet, these people also have high net worth, right?" I mean, it's an extremely important point. At the moment of the crisis, as we're approaching the 07-08 crisis, U.S. consumer net worth was the highest it had ever been in history. Mm. Now, debt was the highest it had ever been in history, including in ratio to GDP, normalized uh, to history. Mm -hmm. uh, but net worth was higher because the valuation of homes and the whole stock market holdings had increased significantly. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of common economists, including ones I visited with at that time, who said there was no reason to be concerned about the debt because net worth was at an all-time high. That was uh, a red herring. That was a misleading factor. Those home valuations were simply valuations. Debt's a contract. Mm -hmm. And does that tend to be the case in general? I mean, as private debt grows, does that tend to have an inflating effect on assets. In this case, it was uh, the assessed value of homes. Um, but but is it just generally the, the case that you, that the reason you're getting a misleading picture is because assets are getting inflated and look to be more valuable than they are? So so everyone's individual books look like they're balancing, but in fact, those asset values are not going to hold up. That is right. You know, another way to say that same thing is that lending itself, ceteris paribus increases asset values. If you have more people lending uh, home mortgages and they relax their credit standards, that fact alone will cause home values to go up, absent mm -hmm. any organic demand. Uh, the same is true for business valuation or commercial real estate valuation. If, if, if you know, I spent my career in banking. If lenders are lending to small businesses at three times EBITDA or pre-tax earnings, uh, those businesses will be valued at about three times even mm -hmm. if lenders uh, decide that they want to take a little more risk and lend it five times EBITDA, guess what? Valuations go to five times even. Uh, the asset values follow lending practices and are a function of lending practices. And that's a very under-recognized fact. And so the, the opposite happens when, when uh, lending spigots are turned off asset values in inevitably decline. And that's, in fact, what happened uh, post-crisis. Okay. So you just tend to get bubbles with a lot of uh, private lending. And it feels good. In the period of the boom, when you are extending loans that eventually won't get repaid, and before you realize that, it feels great. And mm -hmm. everybody feels like they're wealthy. And, in fact, the government also feels like it's wealthy because all this real estate and all the associated jobs and you know whatever other areas are booming, uh, people are paying more taxes, government receipts are higher. Uh, government debt to GDP is 
tends to either be benign or improving. Mm -hmm. Government debt not only is not the cause, it is is something of a contraindicator. In Spain, where private debt to GDP rose 49% in five years, an astonishing percentage, government debt to GDP improved 13% during that same period. Everybody feels like they're winning. Okay, and, and I want to emphasize that you really went back uh, and looked at a number of these things. And a, a, again, as you suggested, the rule of thumb is kind of surprisingly straight forward. It's, it's, it's uh, growth in uh, private debt to GDP ratio of at least 18% over five years. And, um, and then what uh, the ratio of the absolute ratio of, of debt to GDP is 150% or more. That's right. Okay. Um, so we should have, you know, we should have seen this thing uh, coming. I mean, you, you show in the book that this is a pretty, pretty reliable rule. If, if our government had seen it coming, uh, what could they have done about it? Well, regulators have enormous influence. And, you know, I've, I lived with regulators for, you know, 30 years. And uh, there's any number of things regulators can do. They can come in and put pressure on banks' lending policies. And frankly, in this crisis, Lending policies that were part and parcel to this were egregious. I mean, no income and no documentation on mortgages. It doesn't take much for a, a, a regulator to become assertive and be able to, uh, to curb those kind of practices. Uh, it, the other thing that's really ultimately the most important thing is uh, regulators can uh, increase capital requirements or close loopholes where capital requirements uh, are being evaded. Uh, you know, the, the Federal Reserve can use private lending trends in, as a factor in assessing what interest rates uh, they ought to have, and they can move interest rates up as a curb to lending. There's, there's a pretty comprehensive arsenal of things that uh, the, the government can do if the government believes this. And that's a big if. But, you know, if there's a conviction behind it, uh, there's a lot of tools to use. Mm -hmm. So capital requirements is just just a requirement that, uh, you know, banks or any lender have a certain uh, stock of actual assets relative to the amount of lending it's doing. And, and in your experience as a banker, I mean, how hard is it to get around the, the capital requirements? Well, I think, you know, to, to illustrate this, if, you, if you're making a billion dollars in loans, this is a little bit oversimplified, but if you're making a billion dollars in loans, you have to have a hundred million in capital. Mm -hmm. And so if you make another billion in loans on top of that, you have to have a second hundred million in capital. So that capital requirement acts as a natural curb on loan growth and, a, and an appropriate curb. But bankers are always looking to maximize returns to shareholders. So it, it feels like a virtuous thing if you're a banker, and I certainly was in this seat, uh, to find ways to do more lending without having to add more capital. Mm -hmm. One way to do that, for example, is through asset securitizations, off balance sheet loans, as it were. And that lets you do that next billion without another hundred million in, in capital. Uh, one of the things that was used widely during this most recent uh, a boom period was credit default swaps, in essence, insurance on loans that allows you to allocate less capital to these new loans. You know, frankly, from a from the a balance sheet management standpoint, banks and other lenders are always looking for ways to maximize the amount of loans they can make relative to their capital. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, like in the case of investment banks, whereas, you know, kind of the, the rule of thumb is kind of a 10 to 1 ratio, Many of these institutions were operating on 30 or 40 to 1 ratios, effectively had a capital cushion of 2 or 3%. Sheila Baer's done a good job of pointing this out. Mm -hmm. so, so that should have been obvious to us as well, that, that, that the, 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 the lending institutions just weren't in good shape in a lot of cases. Yeah, but, you know, it, it, it should have been. And, you know, Sheila points out that, you know, if we had just used a simple tangible capital ratio, most of the institutions that got in the most trouble you know, would have you would have been able to observe that happening, mm -hmm. but there's a mindset that more lending is good, and that you know, more, you know, uh, rapid growth in loans has has always been something that's been viewed as a positive, and it's been associated with a boom. So there hasn't been this view that we need to police this and we need to be stringent about it. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so regulation, including you know capital requirements and regulation of uh, home mortgages and so on, would would help uh, thin these things off. Once they've happened, I gather uh, you 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 know you have to do what's called deleveraging, right? Which is basically reduce the amount of <laughs> the amount of debt out there one way or another. And I gather the big question is who takes the hit, the lender or or the uh, or the debtor, right? Yeah, but the truth is, uh, in the aftermath of the 08 crisis, there's been very little effective deleveraging. I think on a nominal basis, it's 2%. And um, so we, we, we're still at a very high level of leverage. Uh, there's been a little bit of deleveraging, not a lot. Mm -hmm. And frankly, that's one of the reasons, you know, I, I mentioned the earlier stat about, uh, you know, the since 1950, we've grown from 55% private debt to GDP to 156%. Uh, you know, one of the reasons we're still at this high number is not much deleveraging occurred. And so we're carrying around a heavy load of private debt right now. Uh -huh. And that's actually kind of a global thing, isn't it? It is. An, it is definitely a global thing. And it is more egregious in places like... Uh, Western Europe than is in the United States. Spain, which we know has 25% unemployment, mm -hmm. has private debt to GDP of 216%. Mm -hmm. Portugal, where we had an institution fail a couple of weeks ago, has private debt to GDP of 250%. Mm -hmm. Japan, which is kind of the archetype for this kind of a, of a calamity, they had their 91 crisis and they have been growing sideways in the 24 years since. Well, their private debt to GDP ratio in 1991 had reached 220% and has been drifting down slowly, but it's still, I think, 160 or 170%. It's still high 24 years later and, in fact, is the principal agent of deflationary pressure in that company, even country, even though that's not something that's mentioned by others. If you want to fix Japan, you better go in and, and do something about the still high levels of private debt. Mm -hmm. It's just something that hasn't been focused on very much. And, and Europe seems like a good example of what you're talking about. I mean, almost all you hear about Europe is doing something about the public debts of these individual nations. And I don't think you'd say that's irrelevant, but, um, but it shouldn't be dominating the headlines, maybe the way it, it's, it's, it's not irrelevant for certain. It's not irrelevant, but it is secondary or tertiary. It is not the driver of GDP. It is an expedient. It's a Band-Aid. Mm -hmm. If you want GDP to grow, you better uh, restructure private debt so that you're at, at better levels, and that will facilitate growth. And, and uh, public debt levels will be easier to deal with. And, and in fact, if you, if you really study this in, in great depth over you know, all countries and all periods, you'll see that the agent of government debt deleveraging after World War II was private debt leveraging. Uh, the, the government was able to delever because there was robust growth in private debt in the 50s and 60s to kind of offset that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you talk about restructuring debt, that's a technical way of answering the question I raised, which is like, who takes the hit, the lender or the debtor, right? That's right. That's right. If you, so what does that, what does it mean when you say we should restructure debt? And I think, I think that would be your answer to how America should have handled it largely as well. And so what exactly does that mean? You're right. You know, from my point of view, there was a lot of things done correctly in the 07, 08, 09 period by uh, the government. You know, you, you, it was right to keep lenders lending. You might have gone about it a different way. You might have treated management a little differently in those institutions, but that was a good thing. But what didn't happen then is they didn't go to distressed borrowers and provide them any relief. So if, if you buy the premise that private debt to GDP is too high and it needs to be brought down, and, and by the way, in the book, I cite BIS and IMF studies that support this idea uh, through pretty rigorous research. But if you buy that premise, the question then becomes, how do you get those private debt levels down? And we discuss this in detail in the book, but paying down debt 
as a contracting effect on GDP itself. That's, that's really what happened between 1930 and 1933 was a 25% reduction in the principal balance of loans outstanding that created mm -hmm. a 45% contraction of GDP. So paying down debt doesn't get you there. You can't grow your way out of it because private debt growth always equals or exceeds GDP growth. It, you might be able to inflate your way out of it, but we've run that model many, many different ways under many different assumptions, and it takes you a generation or two at best to do that. So the process of elimination, which I would invite anyone to think through from any direction, but by process of elimination, you end up at a place where the only near-term way to reduce private debt to GDP ratio is through debt restructuring or uh, you know, going out to folks that have underwater mortgages and writing down that difference. And so, for example, if someone has a, a $400,000 mortgage on a home that's currently valued at $300,000, allowing the bank to rewrite that loan to $250,000 to give that borrower some breathing room. Mm -hmm. Today, a borrower that has that kind of a loan is doing all they can to service that loan, and they're not spending on vacations, cars, uh, restaurants, and the like. That is, in effect, the mechanism that's holding back stronger GDP growth. It, it's inhibiting consumption by, you know, kind of middle class people. M absolutely. Pay, paying back the debt. And, and that, that's the down, one downside of putting all the burden of deleveraging on the people who borrowed the money is that these are also the people, middle income, lower middle income, who would be out spending money if they had it. Whereas, That's right. whereas a lot of the people who lent them the money would, you know, they've got plenty of money. So, you know, well, I mean, they, got, they, got rescued. they, they um, got, they got, they got, they got, they got, they got the bailout. Go ahead. The, the, the people that lent them the money got the bailout. The, the people that are still stuck with those loans didn't really get much in the way of assistance. Right. As things played out after 2008, most of the relief in some sense came to the people who, who made the loans. That's right. And the institutions. Yep. And, you know, one thing people say is, well, sorry, go ahead. No, please. Uh, one thing people say is, well, if you let these people who who had the bad judgment to buy a home they couldn't afford off the hook, then they'll go back and make the same mistake in five years. That's what's called the moral hazard argument. But one point you make in your book is that moral hazard is kind of a two way street. I mean, there's moral moral hazard by the people who borrowed the money, but there's also a moral hazard question with the people who lent them the money, right? That's exactly right. You know, you suspended any concern about moral hazard when you rescued the banks. You didn't suspend it for the borrowers. That's asymmetrical. You know? So, um, right. and frankly, so, I, I don't I don't believe. Uh, you know, I, I can tell you story after story, and I'm sure all people know these. You know, th these weren't people that. We're going out and making wild assumptions and, and decisions. They were just first-time bu home buyers in the middle of a boom, or moving across the country mm -hmm. in the middle of a boom. So they bought a house at an inflated level because of their life circumstance. Mm -hmm. So one thing you think should have happened after the last crisis is that uh, we should have handled uh, Lehman Brothers differently, right? I, I I forget exactly what we did with them, but you think we should have done something different? Yeah, the, there's. People tend to think in terms of, you know, what we should have done with the banks as being a binary decision. We either let them fail or we keep them operating with management intact. And so we let Lehman Brothers fail and let a few folks kind of buy the pieces. And then after that, because concerned that that was an error, and it probably was, we propped up these other institutions and didn't allow them to fail. There's a third choice which I think is often the most correct choice, and that is to allow the institution to keep operating, keep the jobs intact, intact, keep the counterparties whole, but replace management and the board, and frankly, replace, you know, uh, change the ownership stru structure, mm -hmm. have the government take it over, but keep it operating. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's one that really wasn't considered or discussed very much. It was viewed as too complicated, but Frankly, you know, through my banking career, that was the typical way that a bank failed. You know, the, the regulators would determine that a bank needed to be taken over. They'd come in on Friday afternoon into the bank, 
uh, fire the management and board, you know, uh, buy, buy the outstanding stock, you know, write down the, the value of the company, uh, take ownership of the company, and then reopen for business on Monday morning with right. all the same employees otherwise. But that, that happens with these little kind of dinky banks that you'd never hear about, but it does happen. And then when you try to do it to a, like, think about doing it to like a huge institution like Lehman Brothers, I guess you get more blowback. Yeah, for some reason it wasn't considered. I, I don't uh, personally consider it to be, you know, much if any more complicated than some of the done ones that are already done. It's mm -hmm. you. It's pretty easy to keep everything the same from an op operating standpoint. It's mm -hmm. harder to make change than to keep things the same. Right. So in that case, the institution, the banking institution, survives as an institution, but the people who had the bad judgment to make the loans actually do pay a price. They get fired. That's right. That's right. Um, and the, uh, th this has, uh, one interesting thing you brought up in the book is, uh, that this all actually has a connection to income inequality and whether you do or don't have a robust, uh, middle class, right? Right. And how does that work? Well, you know, it, it, the best possible circumstance in a country for the growth and expansion of the middle class is a situation where you have less capacity than you need, less housing, for example, or less factories, and low private debt. When you have the combination of those two things, it's ideal because you build that capacity and you use your low debt levels, gives you plenty of room to finance that. It gives businesses plenty of room to finance the construction of, of new factories and houses and buildings. And it gives consumers and small businesses plenty of capacity uh, to borrow to consume those things. That's the circumstance we had in the 1950s and the 1960s that led to such a dramatic expansion of the middle class. The worst situation you can have from a middle class standpoint is one where you have too much capacity and too high levels of private debt because you really don't need to build as much. Therefore, there's fewer jobs required to, to do that building, and you, it'd be harder to afford anyway because of your high debt levels. That's the situation that exists in the United States to some extent right now. It's definitely the situation that ex exists in Europe. It's definitely the situation that exists in Japan. So in mm -hmm. these three major regions of the world, these three major drivers of the world economy, uh, you've gone from low capacity and low debt to high overcapacity and over uh, uh, high levels of debt in two or three generations. Uh, the one area of the world where that was not true, where you still had low debt levels and low capacity, was China and Asia generally. But that's changed. You know, we now have a situation where uh, private debt levels in China have been rising at astonishingly high rates, and they are now at a situation where they too have too much capacity, witness their go cities, and you know among the highest levels of private debt in the world. And so it sounds like we've got a lot of kind of overhang globally. I mean, it just sounds like there's a day of reckoning that lies ahead in some sense for all of us. I, I, I mean, you know, for, for a lot of regions of the world, right? Yeah, I mean, I think Japan is uh, illustrative. You know, they, they, they were going to take over the world in the 80s. We all thought that the Asian miracle and, you know, they had all these methodologies that none of the rest of us had. And mm -hmm. in reality, it was just a massive credit boom. And when their day of reckoning came in roughly 1991, uh, they found that they had way too much capacity, way too much bad debt. And their economic growth in the 23 to 24 years since has been awfully close to zero. It's been under 1% real growth per annum. Mm -hmm. I call it sideways growth. So Japan has had, you know, a generation or two of sideways growth. Uh, you know, we're not as in as dire a situation by some margin in the United States, but, you know, we're, we're I think, looking at a generation of semi-sideways growth, if you will. Uh, lots of Europe is in as dire a situation or, or even worse than Japan was. They're looking at a generation or more of sideways growth. Mm -hmm. um, China's the area where you, you, you may be looking, you know, since 
their credit growth, rapid credit growth is going on right this moment. Mm-hmm. They're the they're the area of the country that could be looking at a crisis. Mm-hmm. Now, now China, by virtue of the nature of its economy, has the capacity to fend off the crisis for a while, in your view, right? Yeah, chi- China. You know, unlike in uh, the United States and Europe and Japan, China effectively owns its banks. And I think a useful way to think about financial crisis, a financial crisis is a banking crisis. A financial crisis is when the government has to intervene and save the banks, usually after they begin to crumble. Uh, in China, you know, we, we've said in the book that if a country has private debt to GDP growth of 18% in five years and 150% overall private debt levels, you're looking at a crisis. China, that growth level has been over 50% in five years. And their overall all levels of private debt to GDP are 200%. So they're at that point. However, the government owns the bank. The, the government's not going to allow the banks to fail, you wouldn't think. But the banks are chock full of bad loans. We estimate that there's at least $2 trillion in bad debt sitting on the books of the banks in China. Mm-hmm. China is, you know, exercising informal forbearance. They're kind of looking the other way and rolling over loans and doing all these other things. So a crisis per se may not be likely. And, you know, what we say in the book is China could go in, preemptively recapitalize the banks and allow those banks to restructure the loans with the borrowers. They've got plenty of places to go for that. They have, you know, at least two or three trillion dollars uh, worth of assets just in the PBOC and in the, you know, the assets they hold as a country, their government borrowing levels are act central government borrowing levels are actually relatively low. They're, you know, 32% or so of GDP. Our, you know, our U S it's a hundred percent, uh, Japan, it's 230% or whatever it is. And, uh, so China could go borrow two or three, uh, $4 trillion and use that and if they did that, they could preemptively recapitalize the banks in China. Whether they do that or not, who knows? But even if they did that, let's just say that they you know, had this insight and went in and preemptively cleaned up the banks and allowed debt to be restructured with the borrowers. China still has way too much capacity. Ghost cities, uh, fa- uh, factories uh, that you know, are producing ships that are unsold, steel that's unsold. Uh, the country's littered with overcapacity and they're compounding their problem by continuing to grow at a high rate. And here's something most folks don't really focus on GDP growth. You know, they were, everybody was really relieved when China announced that they continuing their seven and a half percent growth levels. GDP growth is more a measure of how much capacity you're adding than how much capacity you need. If you're a home builder and you build 100 homes, but they're all unsold, most of that value nevertheless shows up in GDP. So China, even if they cleaned up their balance sheet, has too much capacity and is continuing to add to that at inappropriate and unhealthy levels, they're going to have to slow GDP growth down at some point in time. It's you know, this is going to show up somewhere. Mm -hmm. So this is all kind of scary. I mean, (laughs) just the idea that... Almost global in, in in Asia, in Europe, in the United States, and elsewhere, we continue to suffer from a perilously high kind of ratio of private debt to GDP. And sooner or later, you got to reckon with it, either in the form of another kind of calamity or in a more systematic way. And more alarmingly, still, I mean, uh, nobody's talking about it, right? I mean, all you ever hear about, to the extent that you hear discussions of debt in connection to policy, is really government debt, public debt, right? And That's and, right. You're, and and you're saying that that we're, we're totally missing the picture. You know, you're starting to hear it from some circles. I mean, we're, we're you know, you're, there's some people who are writing on this. You know, we mention a lot of those folks uh, in the book. They're heterodox economists, though. They're not mainstream economists, and so. You know, I'm hopeful that, you know, a, a refocus on this issue is going to happen, but it's it's not a very widespread uh, uh, item of discussion today. Mm-hmm. And we should emphasize that uh, you would rec- you, you would recommend administering the medicine gradually. Right. I mean, I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't want to uh, immediately 
bring the ratio of debt to GDP back down to where you want it ultimately, right? What is your, you, you have a, some sort of timetable on which you would address this problem? Well, I, you know, I, we make a recommendation in the book that actually does suggest that we go in and do widespread restructuring of debt today. Now, that's politically impossible. And I'm sure it's politically impossible in Spain and Japan and, and Portugal. But it is our recommendation. And we think it can be done in a way where everybody looks comes out fine. And the way we recommend doing this is if the banks will isolate those amounts and restructure with the end borrower, the regulators could exercise something called formal forbearance. They could say to those banks, however much you write down, we're going to let you put it on your balance sheet in a suspense account so you don't negatively hit your capital and reserves today. Instead, you can take this over 30 years. Okay. And so we, we, we deal with it, but just a little bit at a time, but right. we give borrowers relief up front. And this, frankly, is something that's been done a couple of times. Paul Volcker did this sort of thing in the Latin American debt crisis in the early 80s. It, he used 10 years, as I, as I, if I recall correctly, instead of 30, but he brought everybody in and said, you know, you got a lot of bad Latin American debt. We'll let you write that down, kind of put it over here. We won't subtract it when we calculate your regulatory capital and reserve ratios. You, you write it off over 10 years. Go and send no more. Uh, and, and, and it was dealt with that way. And, and we're, we're suggesting something very similar. Because what we don't think is we don't think the government should take this problem on because it will just inflate the government's already too high levels of debt. We let a 30-year period of time be our friend and give us a way of solving this problem in a way that provides relief today but spreads the pain over 30 years. Okay. And when you let them write the, 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 the bad loans off of their books, take them off of their books, you are in effect providing relief for, for the, the people who borrow the money and can't repay it, right? That's right. That's right. In fact, you'd only let the banks write that over 30 years if they restructured with the borrower and gave the borrower that relief. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end of the book, you note that this actually, this idea of letting letting uh, borrowers off the hook has a very uh, long history, right? Uh, going back to biblical times. Yeah, it's quite amazing that, you know, we, we were doing study on this and we were beginning to come to the mathematical conclusion that the only way of dealing with this problem, which is systemic and global, is through these restructuring. You know, another word for restructuring is forgiveness, but that's an emotionally charged word. And, you know, in the middle of this research, many people came forward and told us uh, that this is a practice that, that was true in ancient civilizations. This happened in Egypt in Babylon, and it happened in Israel. Uh, and in the Bible, it's referred to as Jubilee. I believe it was every 49th year. Uh, uh, you just forgive all, all the loans every 49th year, right? You hit the reset button. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> and and it, it was simpler, obviously, because the lender was always the king or the priests yeah. instead of private institutions, which is what we have today. But but it, in effect, you know, it, it, it's evidence that this is an, a problem. You know, debt was part of civilization from the beginning. You know, there's a marvelous book by a gentleman named David Graeber called Debt, the First 5,000 Years that I recommend. It's one of the better books I've, I've ever come across, and it mm -hmm. kind of gets into this. But uh, it, 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 it shows that this is a problem that's been around for a long, long time. Okay. Well, listen, uh, thank you, Richard. The name of the book is The Next Economic Disaster. The good news is it doesn't actually have to happen if – if everyone reads this book, it doesn't have to happen. But that's uh, just about the only way we're going to be able to avoid it, right, Richard? It, it, I think it's a good path for folks to spend time thinking about. Okay. Well, thank, thanks so much, and, um, and maybe we'll talk again down the road. Bob, thank you very, very much for your interest. My pleasure.